yeah, this, this year we really felt impressed. I felt impressed that we were to kick off the year uh, with just as a church coming together, spending 21 days, we're calling it 21 days with Jesus. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to dive in a little bit today about what fasting is and what it means. But typically we, we do a fast through our Lent leading up to Easter. But I just really felt impressed that no, we're to take the beginning of the year. Yes. And spend 21 days with Jesus. So I encourage you, today we are kicking that off. It'll last for three weeks. It'll end Sunday morning the 21st. Uh, so um, if you, you haven't decided to do that, I highly encourage you to do that. And, uh, you know, sometimes when a church does special things, let me just tell you what the pastor hears. When, whenever we present to you, hey, we have a new opportunity for you to give, the pastor hears in his head people thinking, oh, they just want my money. And that's not true, because if you're thinking that way, then God probably does need to get your money because your mind is wrong about your money. But that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> but I, I'm presenting this to you today, but I want you to understand, I don't profit anything if you fast. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? The church doesn't gain anything if you fast. This is an opportunity for you to draw close to God. I believe something happens significantly when we do it together as a church family. So, you know, don't just say, well, yeah, they're just calling another fast to call another. Listen, I don't get anything out of it of what you eat and don't eat, right? right. But as your pastor, I want to challenge you to step in and lean into what God's doing in a new season and in a new day. Because we don't know what 2024 holds, and I would rather be in the right place at the right time with my God yes. whenever whatever is coming and know that I'm right with him. Amen? Right. Amen. So uh, I do want to say I still believe that there is a church on the earth that believes in prayer and fasting. But even Muslims believe in prayer and fasting. They do it for 40 days in uh, Ramadan, they, and they pray five times a day. Hindus and Buddhists believe in fasting and prayer. How much more should the church of Jesus Christ, when Jesus himself took 40 days before he did anything in his ministry and just pulled away and fasted. Moses and Elijah fasted for 40 days. Daniel did it for 21 days. Paul did it for 10 days, another time 14 days, another time 7 days. And he actually wrote that there are many times in the New Testament in the birth of the church that he was in fastings, which means it was just a continual part of his life. Peter fasted for 3 days. And in the early church... Uh, on the Day of Atonement, everybody was required to fast. So every writer of every book in the Bible would have fasted for at least one day a year because the Bible teaches that on that, that holy day that every believer was to fast, right? So there, there's throughout your Bible and throughout Scripture, fasting is a major part of the life of a believer. Amen? Amen. It's a major part of the life of a believer, fasting. So I want to talk to you today on the subject of what happens in the unseen world when we fast. What happens in the unseen world when we fast? <clears throat> Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 through 11. And I'm not going to read this uh, verbatim, but I'll ex just expound on it a little bit. But it has a profound lesson for us today and teaches us the importance of of fasting. And this story is about Moses, and Moses is at battle. The, the, the Jewish people, the Israelites are at battle. And God tells Moses, hey, Moses, I want you to go to the mountain, and I want you to lift up your hands towards heaven. And as long as your hands are lifted, this, this physical posture for Moses, that as long as his hands were lifted towards heaven in obedience... It was a physical thing that God had commanded him to do. Go to the mountain, lift up your hands towards heaven. And as long as he was in that posture, the Israelites would begin to defeat the Amalekites, who, was, who they were battling. Pretty simple command, right? Just Moses, just go lift up your hands. Well, if you ever tried to lift up your hands for a long time, it, it, it hurts. I'll never forget when I was learning to, in kids' church, the church I grew up in, they were teaching us how to lift our hands and worship. And i never forget lifting my, uh, my hands and, and worship. But then, you know, I'm like six, seven years old. They got tired, so I put one down. And uh, my uh, Sunday school teacher, Becky Montgomery, man, she was a bus driver and she didn't play. <laughs> and uh, she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, my hand's tired. And she said, well, don't you think Jesus' arms were tired when he hung on the cross? Get him up there. Get him up there. 
And, you know, probably a little legalistic, but I can't. There's not a time where sometimes I have one hand raised and I hear Becky Montgomery's voice and it's like, "Mm, never mind. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, to lift up your hands, you get fatigued, you get weary, you get tired. So what happened is two men, the high priest Aaron and another man named Ur, ran up the mountain and they literally physically took Moses' arms and held them up so that the Israelites would defeat their enemy that the Israelites would defeat their enemy. And here's what I want to submit to you today, that as long as he obeyed physically, he was winning the battle in the unseen world. When he obeyed God's command physically, it did something supernaturally. What does lifting Moses' hands have to do with the Israelites winning the battle? Nothing. It's not like he was up there with a machine gun and, you know, or I'm getting them from the high. There was no uh, connection point between Moses lifting his hands and what was happening on the battlefield other than God said, if you will simply be obedient in this small, insignificant thing, I will then get behind you and will win the battle in the spirit. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching good already. Sometimes we discount what God wants us to do because it doesn't seem big enough or logical enough. Do you remember the man who had leprosy? And, you know, he went to the prophet, and the prophet said, well, go dip yourself in the river seven times. And he says, that's dumb. If you would ask me to do a big thing or a significant thing, but just go dip myself in the river, we can often miss the blessings of God in our lives because we are unwilling to obey the small, which would seem insignificant things, which produces supernatural breakthroughs in our life. So the story is important because it reinforces the fact that physical obedience always brings spiritual release. Physical obedience always brings spiritual release. What we do in our body has, has very much to do with what happens in the spirit. Some would say, well, if God's going to win the battle, well, then he'll just win the battle. It has nothing to do with me. God will do what he wants to do. That's not true. In this story, Moses' arms got tired, and as soon as he put his arms down, the Bible says that the adversaries begin to win over the Israelites. Well, God's going to do what he's going to do. No, he's going to do what he's going to do when you obey what he commanded you to do. Come on, somebody. So what we do in the natural affects what is happening in the supernatural, because physical obedience, I want you to get this today, brings spiritual release. So many aspects, even beyond fasting. The Bible says if you have aught with somebody, to go to them and get it right before you even come to the altar. Why? Because God, there's something about that physical act of, of apologizing or getting that situation right that God says, I can't release to you spiritually at the altar what I want to release into you until you physically get up and go and do something in the natural to get that thing right. And then it will release what is supposed to come in the supernatural. Yes. Come on. So don't, don't always just assume, well, if God wants to do it, he's going to do it. Lord, what part do I have to play? What is the command that you've given me? Is it to simply lift my hands? Is it to spend 21 days in prayer and fasting? What is the part that I have to play? Understand that me fasting or Moses lifting his hands physically has no connection, but spiritually has a lot of connection. Amen? Amen. So when Moses would lift his hands, angels would be released into the battle when he lifted his hands physically. And as his hands started to come down, the angels were withdrawn from the battle and the enemy would begin to defeat them. Hebrews 1 talks a lot about angels. Some of the things that it mentions, it it says that angels are sent out to render service on behalf of those who uh, are heirs or inherit salvation. That's you, that's me, come on somebody. It says in in Hebrews that angels are of God and there are spirits that are sent as flames of fire. And it says later in that same chapter that he makes them uh, ministers of flames of fire. 
He goes on in Hebrews to talk about that there's a breath and there's a wind and a fire that comes from the angels that are dispatched into situations in our lives. Here's the point. As long as Moses obeyed what God told him to do with a physical act, it released supernatural angels into the battle. The battle was won. I want you to get this because of what he was physically doing with his body. So of Moses simply lifting his hands under the old covenant would cause them to win a battle. How much more in the new covenant, in the New Testament church, would prayer and fasting accomplish? Wow. Another verse of scripture that says, don't lift your hands with wrath. And what that means, it means with doubting, with sitting around and saying, you know, is this even going to do anything? Is this going to produce anything? Listen, I'm not in charge of what it does and what it produces. I'm in charge to be obedient with what God's commanded me to do. I do it simply because God said, do it. Have anybody followers of Jesus in here? We are disciples of Jesus, which means whatever he says, we do. The gospel, Jesus even tells his disciples, there's these kind which only come out by fasting and by prayer. By fasting and by prayer. I'm afraid that in the modern church, we've reduced everything down to feelings and intellect and not any physical actions. We say things like, well, I feel like I'm humble, so I never actually have to get on my knees and bow before the Lord. Because I feel I'm humble. I feel like I love the Lord and I worship him on the inside, so I don't really need to clap my hands and I don't really need to raise my hands, even though the Bible is very clear on how we're to worship God. I don't need to stand on my feet and worship God physically with my body because I love him on the inside. God knows my can I say that is one of the greatest deceptions that has infiltrated the church? Yes. Is, well, God knows my heart, and it's how I feel. That's good and well. You bet he knows your heart. But to everything in the kingdom, there's always a physical expression of what's going on in the inside, even when it comes to salvation. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth unto salvation. Well, I'm saved because I believe in my heart. Well, that's not the prerequisite to salvation. It says believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, which is a physical action tied to an inward emotion. Come on, somebody. So you don't even get saved in the kingdom of God unless you put action, physical action to what's going on on the inside. Everything in the kingdom of God that is coming to you supernaturally is all attached to a physical action. The blessing of God in your life that will, the Bible says that, you know, the locusts come in and they eat holes and chew holes in your pocket and they devour. He says, that I will rebuke the devourer for your sake when you, when you tithe. A physical action to a spiritual principle. It's not that God needs your money. He's saying, will you be obedient with your money? You want to receive something? What does he say? Ask, and then you will receive. Physical activity releasing supernatural intervention. It's all through your Bible. But the church has fallen into this. Well, God knows my heart. I'll live how I want. I'll do whatever it is I want to do. Because God knows my heart. The Bible also says that they will know you by your fruit. What does that mean? It means what is producing physically in your life. A tree looks like a tree until it produces fruit. (laughs) Right? And when the fruit produces, it's obvious what's in the root system. There you go. All right. Um. Well, I feel like I have faith, so I don't have to risk anything. I have faith in my heart. (laughs) Everything gets reduced down in the modern church to eternal stuff, and we believe that there has to be no outward expression. 
It's just not your Bible. I wish it was. I wish I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to ask for anything. I didn't have to pray. I didn't have to believe. I didn't have to give. I just had to think it in my heart and... I didn't have to quote a scripture. I didn't have to get his word in my heart. I could live however I wanted to live and just say, well, I believe in forgiveness and that God's forgiven me. Yep, God, does God forgive? But he, what does he say? You have to confess your sins, repent, which means turn away from your sins, and then forgiveness will be granted. Physical activity producing supernatural results. So God sometimes will say, I demand of my people a physical act of obedience before I release a spiritual reward. And fasting often is one of those physical acts of obedience. Why? Because there's a connection between physical action and spiritual power. Physical action and spiritual power. We want spiritual power without physical action. Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. And we, like, we wish we could stop there. I got the power. The spirit of the Lord came upon me. But he says, it's upon me to preach the good news, to, to proclaim uh, liberty, those who are captive, to proclaim the good news to the poor, to heal the sick. Physical, the, the, the supernatural power, according to Isaiah, comes on a person for physical response. Yes, I receive the power because I'm praying for the sick. I'm, I'm giving to the, the homeless. I'm, I'm, I'm helping. I'm prophesying. I'm doing whatever the word of the Lord is to me. When I begin to step out and do it, that's when it manifests in my life. See, we like to wait for it all to manifest. But sometimes, some of you might be waiting, well, I can't start the business, I can't step out, I can't do it until I have all the resources that I need to do it. But God's saying, if you would simply take a small act of obedience and step forward, then you will find our relief supernaturally what you need to get where you need to go. But it's not going to happen first. It's going to happen when you take a step in faith into what God has called you to do. Come on, somebody. Single folk in the house, believing for your spouse, believing for, you know, who God's called you to marry. But, you know, get yourself together a little bit. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Move on from that real quick. So Moses is there with his hands up. And as long as his hands up, Israel wins. It releases spiritual power, favor. Help, protection, healing, miracles, blessing are all released by a physical act of obedience. You know, I often hear this little saying, and if you've been in the church a little bit, you probably heard it, but higher levels, higher devils, right? Yes. And that's a good saying, I get it. But really, I don't like that saying because it, it, it really is glorifying the devil. And what it's saying is the higher I go up in God, the more devils I fight. And it's almost saying, like, I don't want to go too high because there's another devil at another level. Right? Like, you know, I, I shouldn't press in too much because I don't want the devil to, to attack me and, and know who I am. Let me help you a little bit. The devil already knows who you are. But let me submit this to you. Who has more protection on the battlefield? A private, a new enlisted soldier or a five-star general? Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on, somebody. What has more protection around them? The truth is, the higher you go in God, the more angelic protection is released around your life. We just assume that if I'm doing more for God, Satan's going to attack me all the more. And God's like, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, guys. There's not much I can do about it. But it's like God saying, listen, if you step up and you step out and you start believing and you start asking for big things and you start pressing in and you keep going after it, just as you increase in your faith, I'll keep providing more angelic hosts. I'll keep the army surrounding you. I'll have the angels everywhere you go. You won't fat, uh, dash your foot even against a stone. Mm -hmm. Come on. You know, the Bible says that. We can 
that we can have faith where we don't even dash our foot against a stone, that not one of our bones are broken. Is that always manifesting in our lives? No. Do I think God's a liar? No. I think sometimes we are just so used to playing at low-level faith that God's like, well, that's not, that's not required for your assignment. You, you with me? I remember asking my mom that when I was a little kid about, you know, 1,000 foot shelf all my left hand, 10,000 at my right. And I remember we were at a red light and a car pulled up beside us and had the windows down and the beat was going. And, you know, they just weren't, they were different people. And uh, I said, so, Mom, if they pulled out a gun and shot us, we'd be okay. And my mom was like, well, I wouldn't antagonize the situation to try to test God. Because as your faith is, so be it unto you. So what am I saying? If my level of faith isn't established to a place where I can withstand a flying bullet, <laughs> then don't try to get around a flying bullet. Are you with me? So what I'm saying is there are levels of your faith that as you grow in God and you lean in more of God and you start doing significant things for God, that more angelic protection is released around your life. But just because you said a prayer 15 minutes one day eight weeks ago doesn't mean that God has now all the host of heaven surrounding you and the next time something bad happens in your world, you go pointing your fingers at God saying, well, why didn't you work for me? Come on, you put a 10 in the plate eight years ago, and you're still wondering why the blessings of God aren't pouring out in your life. Come on. All right. Preach it. So the more we progress in our faith, the more we step out, the more angelic protection is released. It was Elijah when his servant, they were, they were uh, coming against the Syrians and in the natural, it looked like they were greatly overwhelmed by the Syrian army. And Elisha's servant ran to him and was like freaking out, saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Elisha said, just chill. God's got this. Yep. Prophet said, just relax. And he prayed, says, God, would you open the servant's eyes to see what I see? And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked around, and he saw chariots and horses and fire surrounding them. In the supernatural. Elijah wasn't overwhelmed by what was happening in the natural. Because he had the ability to see and to know that God was up to something in the supernatural. Yeah. Come on, somebody. So we shouldn't be afraid to dream big, to ask big, to believe God for big things. That's why I'm not going to back down because I'm scared the devil will fight me more. Amen? I want to go to Daniel chapter 10, verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant, pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Skip down to uh, verse 10. Suddenly, a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on my palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. So in verse 3, Daniel goes on and he talks about, I ate no pleasant food, no meat, no wine came into my mouth, but he actually gives a little bit more explanation on exactly what he ate in Daniel chapter 1. He goes into a little more detail of what he ate. He says, I ate vegetables and water, and here's what he says. He says, I abstained from pleasant food for three weeks. I abstained from pleasant food for three weeks. He said, I ate no pleasant bread. The word pleasant there means desirable. I ate no pleasant or desirable bread. What I want you to see is that's Daniel's physical activity. 
He comes to God and he says, you know what, God, I, I, I need breakthrough. I, I need heaven. I, I need something supernaturally to happen in my life. So I'm going to commit to you right now that for, for, for three weeks, 21 days, I will eat no desirable food, no pleasant bread, no desirable food. But what I think is fully amazing here, and I want you to see this, is the angel then comes to Daniel in verse 11 and begins to speak to Daniel. And what does he begin to say to Daniel? He says, oh, Daniel... Man greatly beloved. If you study out that word, greatly beloved, it's the same word for desirable. Hang with me for a minute. Daniel said, I will eat no desirable thing. Three weeks ago, I made the statement. Three weeks later, an angel stands before him and says, Oh, Daniel, you desirable one. Are you making a connection here? Yep. God's saying, Daniel, because physically you abstained from what you desired, to me, you have now become the desirable one. Because you're willing to give up what you desired, I have now desired you. What he did in the natural changed something in the supernatural I ate no desirable bread and God looked at Daniel and said Daniel you have become desirable to me I want you to understand this hear me closely there's a difference between God's love and God's favor a difference between God's love and God's favor all right favor is different because it's, it, it's given to us as a gift. But God's love is 100% yours, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing that you can do to make him love you less. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's yours. It's free. God absolutely loves you. But that is not the same as the favor of God. Favor is different because it's given as a gift and it increases in our life as we steward well with what he's already given us. There's the key. As we steward well with what he's already given us. Remember the parable Jesus told of the talents? And he says, I gave some, you know, one talent and some 10 talents. And all, it was all dependent on what they got is when the master came back with what they did with what they already were given. And because they were faithful with what they were given, the master said, now, because I can trust you with little, I will give you even more. God's not obligated to make you rich. What he is obligated to do is produce Press down, shake together, and run over into your life what you've been faithful with. That applies to every area of your life. God's not obligated to bring friends into your life. Why? Because you've been nasty and miserable and arrogant to the ones he's already brought. (laughs) But when you steward your friendships and relationships well... God says, there's somebody I can trust. I can bring people into the world. I can entrust them to handle people. I can entrust them to value relationships, value people. Come on. So that's the favor of God. It's different than the love of God. The love of God, it's free, it's perfect, it's full, and it's yours. But the favor of God does not come in its fullness on your life until you do certain things to attract it. You can't buy God's favor, but you do not get more of God's favor without sacrifice. The increase of favor always comes on the back of obedience and sacrifice. Obedience and sacrifice. And this is Daniel's story. He was feeling the weight and the destiny of his family and his people and his nation 
and he stood in desperation and he knew he had the love of God. He knew God loved him. That's not what was in question here. He wasn't doing physical things to try to earn the love of God, but he understood that something in the spirit had to change. Therefore, he said, I will eat no desirable food. I will push the plate aside for a period of 21 days and I will seek the Lord for those 21 days because I need the favor of God, not just the love of God, but the favor and the blessing of God on my life. It's a picture of unusual increase of favor. So there's something about you doing a physical act of obedience that will produce spiritual release, favor, and blessing in your life. And you, when you respond physically to the command of God, watch out, miracles will come, favor will come, blessing will come, God will raise you up as you say more of you and less of me. Now I want to submit to you that this is a challenge and not a demand. A challenge and not a demand. There are times and strategic moments in your life that God comes not with a demand but with a challenge to you. You don't have to do it. You're not more saved if you do do it. You're not more holy if you choose to fast. But he stands in front of you and he says, I want to give you a divine challenge that in this strategic moment of your life, I want to partner with you that if you do physically like Moses and physically like Daniel, I will release spiritual things as you obey me. I'm convinced that the physical response of Moses raising his hand was recognized by heaven. I'm convinced that the physical response of those lepers falling to their knees and crying out for mercy was recognized by heaven. I'm convinced that the physical response of David dancing before the Ark of the Covenant with all of his might was recognized by heaven. Come on, somebody. The lifting of our hands in the sanctuary to some is unimportant, but God says, I'm watching what you do with your physical obedience to determine what I release to you spiritually. After all, Romans 12, 1 does say, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Come on. Daniel set aside what was desirable. And because he did, God said, Daniel, you've become desirable to me. <laughs> Tim, you can go ahead and come. When we persist in fasting and prayer, prayers break through. Won't take time to read it, but the angel goes on to say to Daniel, Daniel, when you prayed 21 days ago, God heard and he answered. But he said, the prince of Persia, which is something in the supernatural realm, a devil in the supernatural realm was holding up your answer coming. And he said, I, the angel says, I was left there alone, but because, but because you persisted, God sent another angel, the archangel Michael, to come and help fight to release your answer. It's not that, here's what I want us to understand. There's not a battle between God and Satan. Like, that's done. Satan rose up in pride and God just took his little finger, the Bible says, and just went, and Satan was cast out of heaven forever. Satan has been defeated. Right, So there's not like this big angelic war between God and Satan, but there is a war of demonic forces trying to stop things coming into your life. I mean, it outlines it right there in Scripture. The angel said to Daniel, listen, when you prayed, God heard and released it, but the prince of Persia was holding up the answer for 21 days. Could it be that there are things that God has already determined to bless you with and to give you that have your name already written on it? That's right. He's already released it. 
but there are things in the spirit that are holding that from manifesting in your life and God's saying one physical act of obedience will cause that to break out in your life you've been praying and you've been contending and you've been believing and you've been standing and you've been wanting and you've been asking but God says if you just obey me physically you will see it happen in your life that's what this story teaches us Matthew 17, the angels, or excuse me, the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out, speaking of demons? And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you that if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. That's good. It doesn't even take a lot of faith to do this thing just takes the faith of a mustard seed but here's the hinge we like to stop there however words of Jesus however your faith can move it if you got the faith of a mustard seed it'll move the mountain however this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting Oh God, you know, yeah, I have faith. I know you can do it. I know you can do it. I know you can do it. And nothing's moving. Well, I'm, I, he, he can do it. I know he can do it. I know he can do it. I got faith. I got faith. Nothing's moving. However, this kind doesn't move without prayer and without fasting. I don't know what you want. I don't know what's on your heart. My assumption is that you want more of God. My assumption is that because you took the first Sunday of a new year and slippy roads and when it was easier to stay in bed and to do your own thing, you chose to venture out and you find yourself sitting in the house of the Lord today. My assumption is that you want more of God. My assumption is there's something in you that just says, I have to, I have to, I have to get closer to Jesus. And if that's true, if that my assumption is true, then I want to challenge you today to partake in this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Yes. My challenge for you is to say, Pastor, I'm going to lean in and I'm going to take these 21 days and I'm going to spend them with Jesus and I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast. So what does that mean for you? Well, other years, you know, when we've done fast, I have said, you know, maybe it's social media or TV you need to give up. I really felt strongly impressed this year that it needs to be something food. Now, I, let me just say this from the top. I mean, there are many medical conditions and, you know, things that you have to talk to your doctor about and that you have to examine with your own health, and I fully get all of that. But it might be giving up one meal a day. It might be only eating one meal a day. It, it might be giving up, you know, your favorite junk food or, or soda or I don't know. Let, let the Lord speak to you about that. But I want to say this to you. If you don't feel it, it won't move heaven. If you don't feel it, it won't move heaven. Why, David said, I won't give God what costs me nothing. He refused. I will not give God what I did not, what did cost me something. What does that mean? Well, I never eat breakfast, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast breakfast. Done. Well, that didn't. And you expect that to move God? You expect God to be like, you know what? He gave up the desirable thing and now he's become desirable because he gave up, you know, broccoli. Wow. You're all in. No. Don't give God what didn't cost you anything. Daniel said, I mourned for three weeks. There's, there's, when you're fasting and you're doing it right, I get Daniel, it hurts. And you might be pumped up about it today. But by later this afternoon or tomorrow, attitudes are going to be flaring. Your sugar is going to be up. They're going to be down. You're going to be all over the place. You're going to have to pray for mercy to just stay married, to treat your kids well. Because why? When you're fasting and it's working and it's right, it's costing you something. It's costing you something. But here's God's let's just stand but here's what I this is so burning in me Daniel gave up 
the desirable thing. And as a result, God looked at Daniel and said, I now desire you. And this is for you. I, I, I don't know what you need to attach to your fast. I don't know what to believe in God for. I don't know what answer has been held up. I don't know what you, what you, what you need. And this is for you. But can I also say collectively as a church, we need this. I don't want to be a church to just be a church to be a church. I want to be a church because we want the presence of God. And I don't want the presence of God this year like we had it last year. I want more of it. I don't want God to do in our services like he did last year. I want him to do even more and more significant things. I don't want to impact our city just like we did last year. I want to be like the disciples where it says they came in and turned the city upside down. And do you know how we get that? Not by getting more of the love of God because he already loves us. We get that by gaining more of the favor of God. And we get the favor of God when we act like Daniel and we push away the desirable thing because we understand there's something more and bigger at stake here. There's things happening in the supernatural that will absolutely be affected by what I choose to do in my natural body. Therefore, I'll push my plate back. I'll push the sweets aside. I'll come in times of prayer. I'll pray. I'll intercede. I'll ask God. I'll read the Bible. I will get into his word like I never have before during these 21 days. And I will lean in and I will press sin and I believe God to do the supernatural in my world come on somebody I think it was our second year of ministry as a church we challenged our church to go on a 40 day fast during that time leading up to Easter and there was a couple who had come into our church who living a life of very blatant sin and I didn't even know they decided to participate in this fast and honestly, I remember when we announced the fast, I thought, they're probably thinking these people are whacked out. Before the conclusion of that 40-day fast, they were in my office, and the one said, I need out of this ungodly relationship. I need set free. Because I started the fast in sin, but I'm ending it free. God spoke to me, this isn't what he wants for me. I need out of this. I know fasting works. I know it releases things in the supernatural realm. And if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Don't do it. This isn't a dieting plan. This is, this is God breakthrough. So for the next 21 days, every day, besides Sunday, because we'll be here in church, we're going to go live on, on social media at 8 a.m. to do devotions with you. If you can't catch them during that time, they'll be on our social media pages. They can catch them later. Be doing those devotions with us. Be praying. Be reading your Bible. But before you leave today, here's the thing, and I promise I'm closing. Before you leave today, determine now what you're fasting. Now. Listen, I've done this many times, and I knew in a moment what I was to do, but then suddenly lunch happens, and you're like, you know what? Well, here's what I'm going to do now. I decided I'm not giving up the soda, but I'm going I'm to do it now and write it down. Put it in your phone, and it doesn't change doesn't change. I've done fast where it's changed every other day. And if you fall during the fast, it's not legalism. Get back up, recommit to the Lord, and go again. So Father, I pray right now that you would speak to all of us, that whatever it is that you would have us fast and lay aside for these 21 days, that we would understand that we're not just participating in a group diet plan. But what we're doing is we are coming together and we're saying, God, we want more of you on the earth. We want more of your blessing and more of your favor. We want to know you more. We want to hear your voice clearer than we've ever heard it before. We want you to clean out the cobwebs of disappointment and regret and sorrow and sadness. We want you to brush all of that away and reignite the fires that we burned with before. We want to know you so clear. During these 21 days, Father, we commit to whatever it is you're speaking to us right now. We commit. We commit. We commit. And as we walk out these 21 days, I'm believing God for breakthrough in your world, for the enemies in your life to be silenced, healings to be manifest, wayward children coming home, financial problems turning around. 
where you couldn't hear God's voice, now you can't run out of, away from God's voice. Come on, somebody. And we ask God that you would do during these 21 days whatever you want to do. And we consecrate them to you now. And we submit them to you now in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen.